Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Roberta Richards. I am a librarian from Portland Community College, and I also am serving as chair of the staff training roundtable this year. So the staff training roundtable is a fairly newish OLA roundtable. It is a place for any library staff who work with training to get together and network and share resources. Um, some of the members on the committee are dedicated library trainers, and some, like me, just have a very small part of our job um, related to training. And I can't tell you how much I've learned just from being on this roundtable and, and working with the other people there. So it's a free roundtable, if I can put in a plug. So when you renew your OLA membership, feel free to check that staff training roundtable box, or you can log into your membership anytime and, and join. Um, so let me know if you have any questions about that. I wanted to start with a couple of very quick thank yous. I wanted to thank um, Tracy Letmate from Multnomah County Library. She is a member of this committee. And when we got a request to do a training on library volunteers, she knew just who to contact. So thank you to Tracy for her organizational skills and helping to bring this together. I'd like to thank um, Rebecca Gaber from uh, Salem Public Library. You're actually not gonna see her today, but she is our Zoom master. And she is also recording this session. We will post it to the um, OLA um, start page on our website afterwards, and I'll send out the link to everyone. Um, and then very, very many thanks to, uh, to our presenters today, to uh, Lisa Dyer from Multnomah County Library and Carol Aldrich from North Plains um, Public Library. I'm so excited to, to hear your expertise and thank you. And um, I will turn it over to you and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberta, for the introduction and, and to everybody on the staff um, training roundtable for having us and for anybody who requested this topic. Um, it's just wonderful that, uh, that people are interested in hearing about it. So we're, uh, Carol and I are really excited to be here. Um, make sure to mute yourself if you're not speaking, just so that we can minimize any um, sort of background noise. And also, um, you can feel free to be on camera if you would like to, but if you feel more comfortable not being on camera, that is also totally fine with us. Um, we will um, have some time for questions throughout and also at the end, and you can always type your questions in the chat as we go, um, or you can unmute and ask your questions at those times as well. So um, I think with that, uh, Carol, are you ready to introduce yourself or should I go first? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so welcome everybody. It's great to be here with you today. Um, I just, I, I guess April will mark the 11th year uh, for me being a volunteer coordinator at North Plains Public Library. Uh, but I came from a large family in the Midwest, uh, kind of on a farm and um, our library is a rural, um, in a rural area with a lot of the area being kind of farmland. Uh, so I feel right at home. Uh, but I just remember when I was a little girl, kind of our first trip into the library and it was just such a really big thing and just I just discovered such a love for books. So I'm, I'm just so thankful to be there and also working with some of the greatest people um, that I've ever met. So um, I do live in a remote area, so I have a pretty low bandwidth. Uh, so my, I've actually had it go out on meetings before, but I'm, I'm hoping it will be okay for today. So thank you. Excellent. And I'm Liza Dyer, and I am at Multnomah County Library. I've been here for um, coming up on 11 years, and I started as a volunteer in the volunteer services office. Um, I was recruited specifically because I knew how to use our volunteer database, which is called Bullgistics. And um, I had used it in previous positions. Uh, at other organizations, I worked at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry as an early childhood and just general science educator. Uh, and then I had also in the past been an AmeriCorps member at the Port Townsend Marine Science Center in Port Townsend, Washington, and worked for the Whale Museum on San Juan Island. So I have a huge love of connecting people with information, and that's how I came to libraries. And um, also I am pretty much following in my parents' footsteps. Um, my mom was the city of Sherwood volunteer manager for a few years um, back when we lived in Sherwood. And my dad is currently on the board of trustees for the San Juan Island Public Library. So my parents are very proud <laughs> of me being um, 
kind of in, in the family work and um, they're very excited to watch this recording later. So um, thank you to OLA for recording this. Um, so um, all of that said, we are going to get started. And so we've got the slides and I'm running the slides, but if you have questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat. I have them up here on the screen as well. Um, and then if for some reason I have internet issues, I'm gonna knock on wood because hopefully that won't happen. Then Carol also has a backup. Um, and uh, I also just wanna say we only have a limited amount of time today. And so we won't be able to tell you everything there is to know. You know, I kind of wish this were like the matrix where we could just, you know, like plug in a little bit and just download all the information to you all. I think that would be um, amazing and super creepy. So, um, <laughs> so um, we will definitely be sharing um, the slides uh, with, uh, with our organizers here today and they will send it out to you and it will have links to other um, resources that are available to you um, online and for free webinars and other things like that. So let's go ahead and let me wake up this screen. Okay, so we are going to cover today, um, even though we do have uh, um, about an hour and a half, we wanted to leave time for questions at the end and also give you all opportunities to share amazing things that you have been doing with volunteers or things that you're struggling with because a lot of times we're not going to be the experts on your particular situation, but maybe somebody else here will. And so we'd really like to help you uh, uh, help to facilitate and foster that connection. Um, but we're, we are going to talk about the who, what, and why of volunteers, really start with some of uh, those so that we all understand where we're coming from. Um, talking about volunteer management versus engagement, uh, they sound similar, they are similar, but they are different. Uh, talking about recruitment, training and orientation of volunteers, how to support folks. And then, like I said, other places to find information and time for questions and, and idea sharing. So first of all, why do we have volunteers? Um, you know, a lot of times people think like, oh, well, we've always had volunteers or we've never had volunteers. And therefore that is the way that it is, right? Um, but in my experience working uh, for Multnomah County Library and also other organizations, this has held true. And this may be different in your library too. So um, that's one of the things that I really was excited to team up with Carol about because our library systems are so different in terms of size and um, uh, uh, the community that we have. So um, Carol, I'm just gonna, reiterate to feel free to jump in at any time and say like, oh, well, we do this differently. Um, but Carol and I did work together on, on developing this. So um, so why volunteers? They help us to expand and enhance our library services. So the idea is that, you know, I know there are some folks here who might be in an all volunteer run library and there are others who have paid staff. So just keep that in mind that there's different perspectives here. But in general, they help us to expand and enhance those services. And um, in our system, they complement the work of staff. So they're not taking the work of staff. They are not replacing staff. In fact, that is against Bureau of Labor and Industry laws that you cannot fire a paid staff person and then just replace them with a volunteer. It's just not, it's not gonna happen or it shouldn't happen. Um, and also um, volunteers help us make those connections for community, um, better community engagement. So a lot of times volunteers really wanna be a part of something that they love. It's kind of like if anybody grew up watching Mr. Rogers and there was the picture picture on the wall and you got to go behind the scenes and see how crayons were made or trumpets or band-aids, you know, people want that of the library. They wanna see how we do the things that we do. They wanna be a part of that even if the part that they're doing is so small or feels small to them, they just wanna be a part of what we're doing because they, they have so much um, adoration and trust of our, of our libraries. Um, also library volunteers are ambassadors for our, our libraries so they can go out and spread the word better than we ever could. Uh, and that's because they don't have to be here. They're not paid to be here and I know 
probably most of us are not in it for the money as the number one and only thing, right? But um, volunteers, they're, they're not paid to say, oh yeah, that's a great place to be. So they can really be ambassadors for us. And volunteers also are very reflective of our diverse community. And so that's something that we are always trying to do better at because a lot of times people don't see themselves at the library. Um, and that is something that we need to work to overcome. Um, a lot of times best practices in engaging volunteers are really best practices for one type of volunteer. And that's the type of volunteer that you've always had. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so, and then also having volunteers shows that the library is investing in the community um, because we're investing in people, we're, we're giving them opportunities to um, get work experience and to get involved. So those are a few things. Um, Carol, anything else to add at this point? Well, I was just gonna mention too that um, one of the things too is education. Um, a lot of our volunteers, when they come on board, they realize I had no idea there was that much that was behind the scenes, like say in processing one item to get it into the collection. So I think that kind of getting inside information um, also is a real benefit to volunteers. Definitely, that's a great addition because it helps to break down that barrier between what we do in the library and the the patron side. So, um, you know, it, it enables us to give them that access to information, which is what we're all about. Um, if anybody has other ideas of why your library engages volunteers, feel free to put them in the chat as well. So, now we know a little bit about why we engage volunteers, but who volunteers? Who are we talking about when we say volunteers, right? Because this could be different for different library systems. Um, for uh, a lot of us, it means community members who come in at a specific time, specific day for a specific task. Maybe they're shelf reading. Maybe they are um, leading a book group. You know, they come in for a very specific thing um, or they're helping with summer reading. Um, I don't know how many of you have, have summer reading programs that have a ton of youth volunteers, but we do. Uh, well, I mean, here's the thing. I do want to say this whole year has been really different for us, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, we are going to talk about different ways that we engage volunteers uh, during a pandemic and not during a pandemic, but um, there, there are definitely some differences, but uh, another group that is volunteers that we often don't think about as volunteers are advisory board members. So these are our, our folks there. They may not be counted as volunteers. They may not have to submit hours to count them in your volunteer program, but they are still volunteering because nobody's paying them to be there. Um, another one is professionals who present or lead programs on a pro bono basis. So pro bono is another word for volunteer. So volunteer, essentially, the word volunteer is not, it's not a title, it's a pay grade. And the pay grade is you are not getting money for this. <laughs> um, so people who are pro bono, you know, maybe they're compensated by their employer. That's fine. But they're still volunteers for us because we are not paying them. So sometimes um, you know, you might work with a group from a company who's doing a community service day. And so they're getting paid by their employer to be there perhaps, but we are not paying them. So they're, they're volunteers. Um, teen and youth council members, those community service groups that come in. Um, anybody who is coming in to do work at the library and who's not compensated with money. That's basically that. Um, and then also it may be coordinated by other groups. So maybe you're not coordinating it. Maybe it's the Friends of the Library that is coordinating these volunteers, but, um, but in general, those are all volunteers and that's what we're talking about. Um, and so why are volunteers motivated to serve? You know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing volunteers, they say, <laughs> They say, you know, this is going to sound real weird, but I just love books. And I'm like, yeah, no, that does not sound weird. <laughs> Welcome to the library. <laughs> who, 
we are happy to have you. You know, so a lot of times people are looking for their community. Um, they see they see us as like the cool kids in town and they want to be a part of that. Um, but they also, they want to share their expertise. You know, they, a lot of times we get people who are retired educators or retired library workers and they, they're like, well, I've been retired. I, I did that for a few years. Now, now I want to get back to the library. Um, or they want to share their expertise on how to write resumes because they're an HR professional or something like that. Um, they want to fill their day with useful activities. People like to feel useful and they like to feel um, like they're doing something for their community. Um, they want to contribute to that. They want to, they see the community and they're like, oh, how can, how can I give back to the community in a way that feels important to me and provides value, right? Uh, also, uh, sometimes parents or educators or teachers require it. We call that people who are voluntold because you are told to volunteer. And, um, while that may seem a frustrating experience, I don't know how many of you have worked with students who have been told they have to volunteer. <laughs> I saw Dory raise a hand. And sometimes that can be so frustrating um, because they don't want to be there, right? And so, but here's the thing is that it can be easy. And I know I have been frustrated by that in the past, but it, it's, it's an opportunity because if they have a really horrendous volunteer experience, that could turn them off of volunteering anywhere else in the future. So no pressure, um, but <laughs> it really is an opportunity. And it's also an opportunity to talk to that parent or that teacher and say, hey, you know, if you want to send some kids to volunteer, let's work together. Let's figure out a way that this can work as opposed to just waiting for it to happen to you and then being sad when it does. Um, and then also uh, people, they want to be helpful. They're interested in a library career, perhaps. I've heard from so many people that I interview and they're like, you know what, I just want to make sure before I spend thousands and thousands of dollars and um, a ridiculous amount of time doing this thing that I think is going to be worthwhile, but I just want to check and make sure. Um, and then another thing is just social interaction. So um, if anybody can think of other reasons, we would love to hear them. Uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And then also, Carol, I just want to throw it back to you so I'm not taking up all the all the time. I was going to just mention, too, that um, it might not be why they're motivated to serve, um, but we've had sometimes uh, teens that come in the library and we really work on like responsibility, you know, to be there when they say they're going to be there. Um, you know, and actually teaching them, you know, as much as we can uh, from the library end as well. So we've had a lot of people say that, you know, thank you. It kind of got them onto a professional path and helped them get jobs um, even in high school. So that's an, another part that is definitely a benefit for serving. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that their motivation to volunteer may not be why you would volunteer and that's okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate in the volunteer engagement community about uh, altruism and, oh, people should want to be there out of the goodness of their heart. And it's like, well, does that make a difference on how, um, how good they are as a volunteer or how effective they are? You know, if they're there to get job experience and because that is a self-serving thing, great. That may be the motivation that they need. And so we can definitely work with that. Um, so Rita uh, put in the chat, I hope you'll talk about how to help those voluntolds to enjoy and want to be there. I think we will touch on that in terms of supporting folks and um, the benefits that we can provide. Um, but also I just wanna say you are not required uh, to accept any volunteer just because they want to. Uh, that's a, a, big, a big misconception is that if somebody is wanting to give their time that you have to accept them and you don't. And so, I mean, that's a whole, that whole, opens up a whole other can of worms, but um, we will talk a little bit about supporting folks and making sure that they enjoy being there. So what do volunteers get? A lot of times, you know, like Carol said, they, they get that, that type of experience with responsibility. 
something that I've heard from our summer reading volunteers who are all like 96% of them are under the age of 18. We constantly get comments about, yeah, I learned uh, that I, people were counting on me and I've never had that before except for school. You know, so this is an opportunity uh, for the library to be that third place, right? It's not school, it's not home. Um, it's, it's a different place for them. Uh, better health, physical, intellectual, emotional, you know, just in terms of offering that social interaction for people, the physical movement. Uh, we have so many volunteers who are like, yep, that's, you know, shelving is my workout for the week. Um, and also stronger skills and work experience, things that they can put on their resume, because having a library on your resume is going to be uh impressive, no matter where you are. It's like, oh, the library, you know, pe people love a library. Definitely the community connections and, and it's a pathway to participate in service to others. So um, a lot of times people will say, oh, I want to give back. And it's like, well, what did you take that you want to give back for? You know, this is not a oh, you checked out books, therefore you have to volunteer. This is not a, um, uh, a, a consumer-based <laughs> interaction here. So, uh, but people do want to provide service to others because they feel like they, um, they have what they need in their life maybe. And so they want to be able to pass that forward. So um, in this picture, this is one of our former teen council members and um, we, the youth librarian there had, had asked the teens, you know, to write on a whiteboard why, um, why they volunteer. And this person said, it's the only place where I get to work with others my age on things I feel impact my community in a fun and supportive environment. And I'm like, thank you. I did not pay you to say that, but that is perfect. I'm going to use that on every slide presentation from now until the end of time. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what are what are other things that volunteers get that you've heard from from folks who come to volunteer? Feel free to put that in the chat, and um, Carol, feel free to jump in. Okay, I was just going to um, say as well, just kind of what this young uh, volunteer said. But they have a chance to make an impact um, on our volunteer tags that has their name and kind of when they started. We have making a difference since and then the time that they joined the library. Um, when we have volunteers come on board, um, we have say that they're, they have fresh eyes. You know, there might be things that we've been doing a certain way all the time, but having fresh eyes coming in and seeing things, we've had some of the best programs, some of the best um, just even layout for the library um, and better ways to serve. So it's really a win-win. So. Absolutely. Uh, there's uh, someone who is uh, known as um, a very famous person in the in the world of volunteer management. Um, she sadly passed away a couple of years ago, Susan J. Ellis. And she used to say that one of the reasons that we engage volunteers is because they are free to criticize our organizations in ways that paid staff cannot. And that's so hard for people to hear, but I do think that criticism is a collaboration, you know, that uh, I think a lot of times people wouldn't criticize unless they really cared about it. Um, of course, the way that they put it is not always the most tactful, but you know, that's another topic. So I'm looking at the chat here. And so let's see, as a volunteer, I got a career path from Caitlin. Um, Rita says, I have volunteers who work from home because of COVID and they love it. And then Rachel says, this goes with the community connections benefit, but being on the coast, I get a ton of folks coming to the library to volunteer who have newly moved to the area. That is such a great point, Rachel. So um, definitely there are, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember who said it, but somebody, I heard somebody say a couple of years ago that any time that somebody volunteers, it's because something has changed in their life. That could be their work schedule has changed, their uh, caretaking schedule has changed, they no longer have a child um, at home and now they're in school or they are have been caring for an older family member who has moved out. Um, and so uh, one of those big things is moving to a new area. 
and knowing that, oh, I loved my library where I used to live. And now I'm going to go check out my library here. And how can I get involved in that and, and all of that? Uh, Dory had a question, how do we as paid staff respond to such criticism? Whew. Good question, Dory. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to save that a little bit because I'm going to ponder on it a little bit more. Different Zoom meeting. <laughs> it, oh, yeah, it could totally be a different just uh, conflict resolution with volunteers. That's mm -hmm. like a whole three day workshop right there. <laughs> I was going to just go back to what Caitlin had mentioned too about um, getting a, you know, as a volunteer, she got a career path um, and maybe just being in a rural library that um, we have four of our staff right now um, that have been volunteers and then hired on. And since I've been there almost 11 years, there's been eight, eight volunteers that have been hired. Some went to other libraries. So I love that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Caitlin. That's great. Um, so here's uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, that volunteering is the ultimate exercise in democracy. You vote in elections once a year, but when you volunteer, you vote every day about the kind of community you want to live in. And I think that um, there are definitely barriers to access to voting, just as there are barriers to access to volunteering. And so um, you know, one of the things that volunteering allows youth volunteers to do is they can't vote, but they can uh, choose where they spend time in the community unless they're being voluntold to do so, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll save that for another time. So um, a little bit about volunteer management versus uh, versus volunteer engagement. So volunteer management is the process that a nonprofit organization or in our case, a lot of times we're city or county or local government, but we're not for profit. So we're included in this nonprofit. Uh, it's the process that a nonprofit organization uses to recruit, track, engage, and retain volunteers. So it's a very much um, kind of like a human resources sort of feel, right? It's the, it's very, strategic, it's very, um, there's a process. Volunteer engagement, however, is an organizational strategy that encourages collaboration between staff and volunteers to develop meaningful volunteer opportunities that positively impact the organization and the community. So I'm a big fan of having both because I feel like you can't have one without the other. Um, so in a volunteer management definition, there is the volunteer management cycle, which you don't typically starts with planning. So you have to figure out what you want people to do. Uh, recruitment, orientation and training, supervision and evaluation and recognition, and then it goes forth from there. Retention being in the middle, the idea is that if you do all the other things in the donut of volunteer management cycle, you will get Retention. And retention is kind of a tricky topic because retention is like, well, do you want volunteers to stay there forever? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Is retention just we trained them for a position that we hoped they would stick around for at least three months and they did and then they moved on? Great, you retain them. For, that was your goal. So it's not always the ultimate goal to, to uh, keep somebody there forever and ever because it is actually helpful to have different people come in and um, offer different perspectives. So with that, uh, I always think about this, that it's people over process. And so if volunteer management is the process for how we engage volunteers, then volunteer engagement is putting people over that. So you still have the process, it's still there. It's just people are above that. So. Uh, one of the big conversations in volunteer management happening right now is that best practices are not best practices for everyone. They're best practices for the people that they are built for. And so um, that keeps um, a lot of people out. That creates a barrier to volunteering. So if you're maintaining people over process, then you're able to meet people where they're at you're able to welcome them to the library in the way that feels meaningful to, to them and to the library. And um, so that's just a really important thing to do and not just 
have it be a transaction, but really be um, a relationship. So uh, we are gonna talk a little bit about recruitment and then we are gonna each take a little turn to tell, um, tell a story and we'll also have time for questions. So as we're going through this section on recruitment, feel free to just put your, any of your questions in chat. And then when we uh, break for a little story time, then we can uh, answer those questions as well. So why do you recruit volunteers? Uh, get the word out that you want volunteers. That's pretty self-explanatory, right? If you, if you build it, they will come, but not if you don't tell them about it, right? Um, so you can also share your library's community mission and values. So anytime that you are recruiting for volunteers, that's an opportunity for you to get your mission out there. Hey, we empower our community to learn and create at Multnomah County Library. Come be a part of that. It's this opportunity. It's a it's a welcome to the, to the library. And uh, definitely part of recruiting is risk management. So risk management is uh, about, you know, not just handling issues when they come up, but preventing them from happening in the first place, if possible. Uh, and so if you recruit the right people for properly developed roles, then you can avoid some of the negative risks in the future. For example, that's why we interview volunteers. That's why we do reference checks or criminal record checks because we're trying to avoid something bad from happening. And one of the ways that we can do that is through effective recruiting. And a lot of that is setting the expectation that uh, this is what the volunteer can expect. Uh, and also showing that the library has community buy-in. So pre-pandemic, Multnomah County Library had over 2,000 volunteers giving over 67,000 hours of time. And that is time that is volunteers only non-renewable resource. You know, they can't get more time. They gave it to us. And um, that's a gift. So um, we can show that the library has community buy-in. You know, the community wants to be a part of what we're doing. So with recruitment, some of the basics are, number one, tie every single volunteer position that you have to your organization's mission and values. Now, why would you do that? Like, why, why would you not just be like, oh, we need a volunteer to come help us on Tuesdays from two to four? Well, if you do that, if you have a volunteer program that is aside from everything else you do, if you keep it separate from everything that you do at the library, it's easy to cut it right? Because, oh, that's just a program. That's not a service that we provide on a consistent basis. That's a program that can go away. So it's a way to protect the community investment is uh, tying that to your mission and values. Getting specific with the requirements, again, that's a huge part of the um, how you uh, do that risk management is setting that expectation of Yep, you're going to come to this library or you are going to be volunteering at home. And in order to do that, you need a computer. You need, you know, whatever it is that the volunteer needs for that. Um, the time in which it's done. So maybe it works in your library to have people stop by and do shelf reading whenever they want to. But right now, especially as we're limiting the number of people in our buildings, you may want to schedule that. So it's really important to make sure that volunteers can meet that schedule. If there's any age requirements, um, some of our positions, they're only for teens, for example, or they're only for people who can pass a criminal record check, which means they have to be 18 or older. Um, any sort of previous experience. Um, and if you are willing to train somebody to do something, as opposed to requiring them to already have that experience, that is an opportunity for you to um, increase the community diversity of your volunteer engagement. So anytime that you're able to train, please, please do it because, you know, it's that whole thing about how do you get an entry level job when you have to have five years experience? Um, so um, definitely a benefit for volunteering is that people get training. Um, try not to sound too desperate. <laughs> No one wants to join a sinking ship. <laughs> so if you're saying, 
you know, I've seen volunteer flyers that are like, we desperately need volunteers. And I'm like, mm, pass. I'm not interested in that. Um, but you, I mean, you may get some volunteers from that. So um, you know your community better than I do. So, uh, but overall, just be honest and don't overpromise. Don't say like, you're going to get to work directly with our um, collections librarian every week, if that's not true. You know, make sure that you are um, painting the picture that is accurate of what they can expect. And don't sugarcoat things. You know, if, if you really just want a volunteer to come and wipe down board books, that's, that's totally fine, but just be clear about that. Um, yeah. And, and Dory said in the chat that it makes people think they'll be carrying a big load. Yeah. So, you know, people want to know a lot of times our volunteers are like, oh yeah, I don't want to interact with the public. I just want to be behind the scenes stickering books, or I just want to come in and do my thing and leave. So with recruitment, just really try to, um, paint an accurate picture. Um, Carol, do you have things to add or a story to tell about recruitment? Sure. Um, first, I was just going to share our um, library volunteer purpose statement, which is uh, library volunteers help make the library enjoyable and accessible to all members of the community by providing high quality services and programs for our, our patrons. One of the really cool things about my job is our library actually was started by volunteers. So um, it was started in a closet, a janitor's closet in one of the community rooms. And it was just a lot of community members who wanted to get books for the community. So it had this whole labor of love um, kind of that started it. But then um, a very successful businessman in our, um, in our community, he decided to give a library to the community. So he he totally built um, and I think we raised money for the um, the landscaping and like the things inside the library. But it's just when you walk into the library is there's just a feeling of, you know, like the com the community's heart kind of is there and it is kind of the front porch of the community. Um, but because of that, I think there is a different, you know, there's so much respect for our volunteers in the volunteer community. We have a, a city that has a very high um, percentage of volunteers for all the different things, whether it's firefighting, you know, all across senior center, all of these different things. So we have a kind of a culture of volunteerism. Uh, so that hasn't been too hard, you know, as far as recruiting, but we go to like farmer's market when we had farmer's market, you know, we just have a table and just keep your antenna up. Um, you'll never know when you might get a chance to, you know, meet someone that's just like, hey, that would be perfect for a program, you know, or, you know, I wish, you know, I could somehow connect this Spanish language with a Spanish story time. And we were able to do that, you know, so I just try to, you know, when I meet people, <laughs> like I said, I kind of have my antenna up. So we had, um, even though we're a very small library, we had over 200 uh, volunteers give some hours last year. So anyway, it's it's been a joy to tell you the truth. I just love it. So we have volunteers that bring their friends. We actually have, I think all the staff's families have, have volunteered. You know, it's just... You know, we have, I created junior volunteers just because we had um, parents that wanted their kids to learn early um, and they would be there with them at the, at the library. So it's just, anyway, it's kind of fun. Yeah, uh, so I recently recruited some volunteers to help out with, um, one of our programs and we needed volunteers to be at home because we physically do not have, you know, the appropriate space for them to come in and work. So we didn't want them to come in and do this project, but it is putting together 200 page resource binders for uh, parents who are going through um, an early literacy program um, 
for um, Spanish speaking families, listos para el kinder. And so the program coordinator for that program was like, oh, do you think we can find a few volunteers for that? And I'm like, oh yeah, we can. People are hungry for at home volunteer opportunities. They wanna do something. Um, they wanna do something also that's not just on the computer too. And so I sent it out to our volunteers and I knew it was going to be popular. I just, I just knew. So I sent it out, um, I don't know, 5 30, 6 PM on a weeknight. And by the time I logged back in, in the morning, eight 30 or nine, we had over 30 people had responded and they were like, yes, I want to do this and I can come pick up or I can go to the library. And so we were able to fill that very quickly. And so um, just because I didn't want to lead people on uh, with, oh, we have these opportunities, I, I closed that that interest form. We used a Google form. And, um, but I put on there, you know, thank you so much. We had a wonderful response. And if you're interested in other future at home projects like this, please contact us. And then I got another 10 people email us and say that they would be interested in doing that. So now I have a pool of over 40 people, and these are adult and youth volunteers who are willing and interested to do at-home volunteer projects. So now the next time that I have one, I'm going to go to that pool of people first. Not only is that a way to honor them and their interests that they first expressed, um, but also it's a way that I don't have to do the... uh, (laughs) the method of spray and pray, which is to spray the same message to a whole bunch of people and then just pray that you get the right people in the position, right? And so I can just go to that that pool of 40 people, 45 people, and say, hey, we have this opportunity. If you are interested, please let, let, let me know. Um, I see Rita said in the chat, how did you say you recruited them? So I have an email list of all of our volunteers who were active as of March 2020, and I have been emailing them um, monthly, just updates about the volunteer program, um, promoting some of our our online events that they can participate in, um, and sharing other recruitments, like we've been recruiting for adult literacy tutors to do online um, one-on-one tutoring with with adult learners, and um, so I was able to use that email list, and it went out to, I want to say around 800 people. So, you know, 40 out of 800 is not bad, especially in, um, you know, about a 12, 14 hour span of time. That's not the same for every community, I know. Um, There's also, um, yes, so Tracy, what tips are there for recruiting when a library doesn't have a ton of folks already to reach out to? I am glad you asked because we have a slide here and I'm wondering, um, places to recruit, perfect. Thank you, Tracy. So, uh, you know, when you don't already have a large volunteer pool, don't fret, there are people, um, especially right now, people are looking for things to do. So um, word of mouth is the number one way that we recruit volunteers is, you know, maybe in your community, everybody knows about the library because it's the place that they go for books or computers or internet access or what have you, but do they know that they can volunteer there? They may not. And so um, definitely word of mouth. So if you do have volunteers already, ask them, tell their friends. So that's what I did with um, a recent adult literacy recruitment where I was like, you know what, we're looking for people who don't necessarily have tutoring experience, but uh, are willing to work with adult learners who are learning English. Do you know somebody who could do this? And because right now it's virtual, you don't even have to be in Multnomah County. You can be anywhere. So please share it with your friends. Um, Flyers in your library, in your community, putting flyers up, old school, it works. It does, you know. Um, So if you know of any community bulletin boards or local businesses, I know people aren't out and about as much these days, but definitely flyers can help. Um, Your library's social media and newsletter, um, other online community 
organizations like Nextdoor, you can post volunteer opportunities just as an individual. Um, volunteermatch.org is an online volunteer center. So somebody can search for um, a specific type of volunteer opportunity in their area. Um, they can also search for virtual opportunities. So if you're looking for somebody to uh, volunteer virtually, you can have that posted and then um, people will be able to search for that. Um, if you have a local United Way, oftentimes that's the local volunteer center. Um, houses of worship like churches, synagogues, mosques, um, other religious-based community centers, oftentimes they, it's part of Part of what they do as a, as, a, as a religious community is to serve together. So that's definitely another one. And then um, local service groups, um, you know, thinking like uh, Sir Optimus and Kiwanis and Lions and, you know, that they can do that. And then another one I didn't list here, but is uh, other like-minded organizations. So, uh, you know, in the past, I've reached out to um, we have a local nonprofit here, the Children's Book Bank, and they mostly do um, uh, like volunteer projects where you can come in once and then um, not come in again, or you can come in more regularly, but they're, they're repairing uh, gently used books. So they don't really have opportunities that are the same as us. So we're definitely not in, in competition for volunteers, which I, I will not dive too much into that because the whole competition for volunteers is kind of a weird topic. But but I asked them, hey, would you be willing to share this volunteer opportunity with your volunteers? And it's, you know, whatever the project was. And so we were able to get some volunteers just by asking another organization to share it with theirs. Um, Carol, what am I forgetting? Well, one of the things we did, too, is we partnered with a big uh, tech company um, and um, one of the ones that they couldn't come to the library. So we took a project to them um, and we had, I think it was over 25 people uh, work together on that project. But we also put out like to help our friends online uh, book sales also to the big you know, tech companies because a lot of times they're looking for things. And some of the companies, they actually pay um, the, it's a nonprofit uh, to for their uh, company members to volunteer. So that part is, was really good for our friends of the library as well. Um, we have a water bill, our city water bill also um, that we've sent out different uh, things if we did you know, need somebody for a specific thing. Um, that's been really good just for the whole community. Um, let's see, I think, that's, I think that was everything in our notes. And I see in the chat, Rita asked any tips for recruiting teens specifically? Definitely. Um, do you know teachers in your area who teach teens? You know, find out if there's anything that they are wanting to do. Can, you know, is there a way to tie that to the curriculum that they're already learning about? Um, and uh, definitely if you have adult volunteers, ask them to talk to teens that they know. Um, uh, also there's, uh, like we usually get volunteers who are from, um, they're like, oh yeah, I need service hours for key club or, um, other ones I'm blanking on their names right now, but, um, and another one, an idea that I've heard, I haven't used it, but I would be interested to try it, but I heard about it from a colleague in California is that they actually, talk to local real estate agents and that those agents, when they are selling a home in the area, they'll often give an information packet about here are local restaurants and attractions. And so they were able to get their organization's volunteer flyer into that packet. And so um, I was like, oh, that's so smart. Um, another one that I saw when I was visiting Nashville, Tennessee, was uh, this restaurant where the table numbers, you know, you go up to the counter, you place your order, then you take your table number. And the table number was actually a, it had the number on it, but it also had information about a local dog rescue and how you could donate or volunteer with them. So, you know, if you, um, if you know places that teens are hanging out, you know, whether that's school or local businesses, just go to where they are. Don't expect that they're gonna know that you have opportunities for them. 
So uh, Kelly has a question in the chat. Has anyone had issues when a business approaches you to volunteer, but once you bring up the background check, it seems like they lose interest. So I'm going to leave that there and encourage anybody who's had that experience to connect with Kelly. And then, so training and orientation is going to be our next topic. Um, it's, it's a part of onboarding. It's an opportunity to share those expectations up front. So here's, we're, we're orienting you to, to um, our organization, but also what you can expect from us. You can set them up for success. I often tell people that nobody comes to volunteer at the library with an intention to screw us up. Nobody wants to do that. That doesn't feel good. Um, nobody's coming to sabotage the library by volunteering, you know, not intentionally. So by training them, we help them to succeed. And it really benefits everybody. Because if you've ever been around somebody who wasn't trained properly, and then you're like, uh, I, now I have to do something. I don't know what they were told because I wasn't at their training. You know, it, it can get really difficult really fast. Um, and, and then again, we've mentioned investing in the volunteer. So it's, this helps the, um, the volunteer to, to grow as well. So with training and orientation, definitely things you want to keep in mind is you want to provide the tools and resources and the knowledge that they need. And that includes the invisible culture of your organization. So if it's a thing that um, people don't talk to each other in the morning before they've had their second cup of coffee, maybe mention that to the volunteer who comes in cheery first thing in the morning. <laughs> um, you know, explain why things are done the way they are. Sometimes volunteers, they'll be like, oh, I figured out this other way to do it and it's going to be faster. And it's like, well, actually, we don't want to be faster. We want it done this way because there's a reason. Um, oftentimes, there's already staff training available. So is there any reason you can't provide that to volunteers in the same way? Sometimes there is a reason, like it's not... Um, friendly to the volunteers because they haven't had the same kind of library experience that the training for staff is addressing, right? So, uh, but sometimes it is helpful. And remember that they don't, you, they usually don't have as much time to learn something um, as paid staff do. So for example, if you work at the library 20, 30, 40 hours a week, and you have all that time to build on your skills, but you have a volunteer who volunteers two hours once a week, the amount of time that it's going to take them to reach the same amount of time you work in a week is going to be months, potentially. So, um, so I guess just keep that in mind. And then sometimes people ask about the differences between training and orientation. And so Training for volunteers is often how to do something. Um, you want to train them on safety and ergonomics. Here's how we move that, that book crate. Um, maybe the training is done once or you chunk it out. Like, okay, the first time you volunteer, we're going to go over this. Next time you come in, we're going to go over this. Because I don't want to give you all of your training in one day and then have you forget it the next time you're in. Could be done one-on-one -on -one or in a group. Could be done online like this. Um, and, uh, could be pre-recorded, could be live. And I see, uh, Caitlin in the chat, volunteers may not want to stick around if they aren't trained properly because no one likes to feel like they don't know what they're doing. Definitely. I have had volunteers disappear and then I don't know why. And then follow up and say, Hey, what happened? Oh, well, nobody really showed me how to do this thing. And then I just stopped showing up and nobody noticed, nobody called me. So I figured they didn't really care. Um, so, and then with, uh, with orientation, uh, typically that's done at the beginning of the volunteers experience. And it's, it's all about what's important about the library and, and the program that they're going to be volunteering with. Um, what are some of those organizational culture and structure things that would be helpful for them to know about and definitely policies and procedures that they are expected to follow. Um, any I want to throw it out just to throw out um, questions in the chat and also Carol, um, I'd love to hear stories you have about training and orientation. Sure, thanks. Um, and just to reiterate, um, it's 
kind of really important in the training and in the orientation uh, to be clear, you know, about what's expected. Maybe the positions um, that you, you know, are going to be placing them in, um, a little bit about the culture, just like what we mentioned. Um, but we usually go over kind of a history um, as well as training. So kind of a history of our library, kind of just where, we, where we're coming from, uh, but also maybe expectations about, you know, if they're sick or snow, you know, just really be super specific on that. Um, and um, so we do all that training, but then we try to do some really fun things as well. And so um, in the past, I've had, had this idea to do before and after hour training. And I, I just brought one of the ones uh, just to share. And we had a, a couple of staff and one volunteer that did it. But so we met before hours and I had some tea and scones uh, for everybody to share. But we had kind of a overview of the processing and repair, which was like 20 minutes. And that was one from one of our staff, just to kind of show them exactly what we do when we um, bring items into the collection or repair them. And then we had a volunteer that, uh, she taught massaging the spine. Books need a back rub too. <laughs> and it was just how we prepare the books just so they nobody breaks the binding or anything. So we're, we're actually, um, you know, working on the books. And then we had a staff person shelving basics and introduction to random acts of shelving um, for 30 minutes. And then we had the people that wanted to be serious processors and repair volunteers stay for an extra 30 minute training. So we ended up creating the League of Extraordinary Processors. <laughs> and they still, <clears throat> you know, we call them when we have a lot added to our collection. And it's just, it's just really fun, but added just kind of element of social, which I know now it's not always that way, but um, social, but learning something and just making it really fun. So. That's everything for right now. <laughs> um, I saw a question just show up in chat from Blake. How do you talk to staff members who feel that volunteers take more work than the return benefit, so they'd rather do it themselves? At a smaller library, the work of managing volunteers is likely to be shared by everyone. Absolutely. I mean, even at, at large systems, uh, there is some some level of expectation that that. Um, everybody should be a part of this because we are all a community. And um, there was one youth librarian I knew who retired a few years ago, but um, one of the things that he did for the summer reading program specifically for the volunteers that were coming in, because we had two volunteers coming in per shift, per two to three hour shift all throughout the day, every day of the week. And it, it's a lot. And none of us work seven days a week, so we can't all be the one person that volunteers know. And so the way that he phrased it to his, his colleagues was he said, okay, we're going to have a different cruise director for each day. And your job as cruise director is to um, greet the volunteers, uh, get to know the name of the volunteers that are there on the day that you are the cruise director. Um, you know, the cruise director is not somebody who is expected to know all the things, but just on your day or your shift, maybe this is your four hour shift, you get to know the volunteers. And because the volunteers want to know that you see them, um, I mean, literally see that they're there <laughs> and that you notice when they're not there. Um, I think like your question is, is um, definitely a really deep one. It's something that is always been challenging to me, no matter where I've worked, what type of organization, whether it's a library or not. And there are always going to be some people who feel like that's not their job. And so part of that is the expectation of when they were hired, when the paid staff was hired into that position. And so it's not just something that's thrown at them because nobody likes to have a job expectation thrown at them when they weren't expecting it. Um, and so I think a lot of it is that conversation that you have up front, if you can. Um, of course, that's not always possible. Um, but maybe figuring out with staff, especially staff who are criticizing or who don't want to work with volunteers, find out what, uh, what they feel about. And not, not trying to fix this or, or find a solution necessarily, but just hearing them and including them as part of the process and then 
trying to figure out what would work. Um, Carol, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, that's a good question, uh, Blake. And I try to match up volunteers with staff people. And, you know, if, if I hear, you know, hints of something maybe that's not working, first I try to see possibly is there another volunteer that might work better with that person. But then I also try to talk to staff and ask them, you know, where can a volunteer help you with all the work that you do? And then I've actually went in at that, you know, the schedule when that volunteer was scheduled and just I oversee, kind of see what's going on and everything too. So I've tried to do it that way to just try to work out any problems. Does that help any? Hopefully. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. The, the thing with working with people, as I'm sure you all know, is that um, one size does not fit all. Your mileage may vary. Um, it's an iterative process. All of these things that we say um, are true. You know, working with volunteers is a, it's a, it's all about relationship management. It's not, it's not just about putting people in, you know, putting people in the machine and then saying go. It's something that does need that ongoing support. So speaking of support, um, you know, why do we support volunteers? Uh, training and orientation, oftentimes those are done once and that's at the start of the relationship with the, with the library and, and with the volunteer. So ongoing support is really needed to make sure that things continue to go well. Um, we had a volunteer once who was, uh, had volunteered with us for probably decades and kept coming in and, um, and one day there was a staff person who said, Hey, how, you know, how's it going? How do you, um, you know, do you like the work that you do? Cause they were just being friendly and the volunteer goes, no, not really. And they were like, well, what, uh, why do you keep coming? You've been coming for years. Oh, because, because it's what I do. And nobody said I could do anything else, you know? So it had literally just been somebody who had been coming for so long not being necessarily the most chatty volunteer um, and just kept their head down and just did the work. And since nobody checked in, nobody found out that that was not something that that volunteer wanted to do. And they were so duty driven that they just kept doing it. Um, so, uh, you know, volunteers, they're, they're not invisible. So let's not make them feel that way. Um, a, a lot of times it's just a matter of saying hello when they come in and saying, how's your day? And um, you know, I know virtually uh, that's very different, but being able to just send a quick email or call them up on the phone and say, hey, how's it going with your project or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, um, and uh, because volunteers, because they're people, they like talking about their experiences. And if their experiences are good, then that's great for the library. That's great for the volunteer. That's great for us. If the experience is not good and they're not coming to you because maybe they don't feel like the door is open to talk to you, then they're going to maybe talk about their bad experience. Um, so I think that can definitely happen with, uh, you know, youth volunteers who are voluntold to volunteers. They're like, oh, yeah, I don't I don't like how this is going, but nobody asked me how I want to do this. So I'm just going to be grumpy and tell my friends that I dislike it. Um, and then I want to share this quote from Toby Johnson, who is a volunteer uh, management consultant and trainer. And she said, volunteer talent management is all about supporting volunteers so that they can take personal risks and emerge victorious. I just thought that was so cool. Like, you know what? Everybody's taking a risk by coming um, to the library to spend their time doing something. And if they can feel great about that, then more power to them, more power to your library. You know, if you make people feel good, like that's not your number one job, no. But if you can help them feel like they did something great and that they made an impact and, you know, part of that key is knowing um, what their motivation to volunteer is. You know, if their motivation is to get back involved with the library um, or with the community or get to know, um, you know, get to know their community, then help them feel that in, in how you support them, you know, find out like, oh, you're new to the community. Um, you know, you've been volunteering for a little while. That's wonderful. Are there other things you're interested in learning about our community? And how can I help you find those things? You know, it's, it's connecting the people to information, right? 
Um, so Dory, I see your, your question, how do you help volunteers realize they can express any dissatisfaction? <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I like to do, um, is I, I don't like formal meetings. I'm just not a formal person at all. And so I really like to be casual. And so when I'm talking to a volunteer, like, Hey, how's it going? Um, you know, it's, it's a conversation. And so I can ask, you know, Oh, was there anything that, um, that we didn't train you on that you wish you had known or like, is there anything you wish you'd known before you started or, or that are there things that you're curious about? And just like kind of asking those questions that are not yes or no questions, but that are going to elicit some conversation so that you don't just go to them and say, hello, I would like to hear how you're dissatisfied with volunteering. Right. Cause we don't want to do that, that nobody's going to, you know, if, if they do respond to that, you may not want to hear it. <laughs> um, and so being able to um, have an open conversation with a volunteer can help to find out those things because they're going to, they're going to care enough to say, you know what, I am working on this one thing and I'm really confused about this, or I really don't like this, or um, they may feel like they, they don't like a part of what they're doing. And if there's a way that you can help them to either not do that part or to do it in a way that makes it easier, like dividing up that task of like, oh, yeah, you don't like um, dusting shelves for two hours. Why don't we see if we can divvy that task up amongst different volunteers? You know, so that, and that's part of the engagement, volunteer engagement, not management. Right. So is being collaborative. And so telling people that like. If you have any issues or any questions about volunteering, please come to me or here's how to reach me or um, I'm going to introduce you to this other staff person. You can talk to them too, you know, so that you are not the only person that they talk to. Um, yeah, Carol, anything to add about that? About um, I would just agree that keeping that communication uh, line open is really important and um, like be checking, you know, if things are going great, you know, just keep, you know, keep that communication line open. Um, but we also have, it's a suggestion box uh, that could be put in anonymously in our library. So there might possibly be uh, things, you know, that, you know, if somebody was dissatisfied, they could put that in there anonymously too. But so far, you know, people seem to be pretty open and anyway, so that was a good question. Thank you, Dory. So one of the things that I talked to some of my colleagues at Multnomah County Library about is supporting volunteers with kind of these three C's. And the first is that your role is to coordinate. Sure, that's the kind of the, the volunteer management side of that. That's you're coordinating the, the schedules, you're coordinating training and orientation. That doesn't mean you are doing all of the training orient and orientation. Maybe you're having a coworker do that. Like, oh, you know, I really want to, uh, you know, this is a really good opportunity for that, that coworker who has to have things done a certain way. I'm like that with some things. And I would rather be the person who trains the volunteer on that thing because I want it to be done right. So that could be a way to engage somebody who's not necessarily the most like, um, outgoing volunteer friendly person. Um, and also coordinating recognition. So um, I really love what Rita and Blake have said in the chat about everybody loves to know they're cared about birthdays and holidays are nice opportunities. Um, I've stopped in to tell a volunteer a specific result of their work, like how much children love the craft they help prepare. That's part of recognition. And you know, a lot of times we talk about volunteer appreciation. And sure, there's appreciation, but there's also recognition. And recognition could include wow, that program was really hard because there were a lot of patrons and da, 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 da. And you know what? I see that you worked really hard to figure out a way to make sure everybody was safe and comfortable in that room. And that's, you know, it's not the um, general, thank you so much for being here, which is definitely one way of doing that. But it's a recognition of, I see how hard you worked or I see how hard this was for you. Um, another C is cultivating because you're cultivating the relationships, not only with the volunteers, but with your coworkers, with other staff at the library. And then also if you are in a system where you are not the, the volunteer coordinator, um, so then you 
cultivate that relationship. And hopefully they're doing the same thing with you. Um, and then definitely communicating again with those three primary groups, volunteers, um, staff at your library and volunteer coordinator. Um, you know, if you have all staff meetings, that's a good time to address everybody. Um, but also just having conversations with folks. And then another thing Dory said, listen to volunteer suggest suggestions to improve next time. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite things is doing things as pilots. So, okay, we're going to pilot this. And if it doesn't work, we're going to change it or we're not going to do it. So I really want your feedback about this. And then get the feedback and then, oh, wow, that didn't work. Here's what we're going to change based on your suggestions. Um, so that can definitely be really powerful for volunteers to feel like they're a part of that process. And so, um, you know, checking in with your volunteers informally is just really the, the number one thing with supporting volunteers is literally just check in with them casually. Um, connect when things are going well so that you're not only talking to them when there's a problem. <laughs> you know, if somebody, if your manager said, hey, can I, can you come to my office? You know, that initially I would be like, <gasps> except that I have a really great manager. So if she said that, I would be like, oh, okay, maybe we're gonna talk about like, um, you know, a birthday card that we're gonna give to our other coworker and I need to sign it secret secretively or whatever, you know? So it's building that relationship um, and not just waiting until there's a problem. Um, and when difficult situations come up, um, address the specific behavior and not the character of the person. Um, you know, I've had, uh, I've had lots of staff say like, okay, how do I tell this person this? You know, like let's brainstorm how I'm gonna tell them because here's the issue is they just don't get it. And I'm like, well, you're not gonna say that. Um, so I'm glad you're getting that out with me and then we're gonna brainstorm it because that's not gonna help the volunteer change their behavior. So what is the behavior? Um, oh, they come in and um, they, uh, they, don't put the books on the book truck the right way. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about that. Um, and then managing outcomes and not people when you can. So like our goal for this is to get all of the children's books out on the shelves in this amount of time so that they're available for people to check out as opposed to, hey, you need to do this faster. So there's just different ways to frame that. Um, and then also supporting volunteers really isn't a one person job. So um, some of the things that the roles of all staff can include is being welcoming. It's literally just looking up from your work and saying hello when somebody comes in. I mean, we should all be aware of who's in our building anyway. And if you don't recognize somebody, that's just a safety and security thing, right? Um, and getting to know people when they, when they work and their names, notice when they don't make it in. Um, if you have a concern about the work that they're doing, if you feel comfortable bringing it up in the moment, oh, hey, I noticed you're doing it this way. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about the new way that we're doing that, or I'm not sure if this was part of your training when you started, but here's how I do it. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, go to somebody else, another coworker who would maybe feel comfortable with that, your manager, the volunteer coordinator, if you have one. Um, and making sure that you have work ready when people arrive. Because if you don't have work ready and then volunteers are just standing around, they're like, well, y'all weren't prepared for me. So I don't really feel like you care about me. Um, could be the assumption that they walk away with. Um, and definitely, you know, if they have questions or they look like they're confused, that's a really great in that you can just talk to them. Um, Carol. Anything that you want to talk about? Okay, sure. Um, I was going to say, um, as far as supporting, just remember, too, um, that we wear a lot of different hats, especially like in a little, a small library. Um, but don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, also, like, we don't have logistics or anything like that for keeping track of volunteer hours. And we have a lot of hours that I have, you know, somebody doing stats for me, you know, so when you're, you know, trying to manage all of this, you know, just remember that you take care of yourself too. make sure that you don't just load too much on yourself. Uh, but one of the really cool things that we had um, 
is about supporting volunteers is we got uh, from our children's um, ministry or children's outreach, we got um, a video that came back and it was of the little girl doing the craft and then just saying thank you to our uh, story time coordinator. And immediately the staff said, make sure you send it to the volunteers um, that actually put that craft together. So I think those types of things of being really thoughtful of just, you know, behind the scenes work, you know, that, you know, that really goes a long ways. Um, but in North Plains, we have like three different ways to um, show appreciation that are like big events. And we have like a spaghetti dinner uh, that the city puts on. And it's not only just for all the volunteers in the community, but also it's for um, the community as well. Um, and then we have an unbirthday party uh, that's for the volunteers. It's just full of a lot of social times and fun and uh, fruit and just good food. And then we also have just desserts. And that's something that the staff provides different things for and just a time to see the, you know, see the volunteers and tell them thank you. Um, so I do this weekly connection. Um, and so I think communication is a real key, but it has sometimes tips of the week or it has uh, different quotes, you know, encouraging quotes, things like that. When our library shut down in March, as far as uh, not being open and we didn't have any volunteers at that time, I was concerned um, about everybody. So I started something called like a daily library joy uh, that went out and our volunteers came alongside of me and they started doing research and finding, you know, places like there's a virtual tour of a garden, you know, or a museum or, you know, things about NASA, you know, opera, concerts. So um, I work four days a week, 10 hour days. And so for those four days, all the way until we started our summer reading program, there was a daily, uh, daily joy that went out besides the weekly connection, uh, just kind of connect. And I think that's a good way. And I heard back from so many of our volunteers and actually, we actually added community members because um, we heard back that they would like to be getting a library joy too. Um, but it was just a really great way um, kind of to connect through this kind of tough time. And the volunteers just really came through uh, for that. But let's see. And then we did some community connections too, where the uh, library director and myself alternated with the presentations and we added volunteers in. So we did remote learning. We added some homeschool veteran, you know, homeschooler moms uh, into that. And then we had one of our volunteers has a master's of social work. So we did one on, you know, mental health and, and balance. And then we had, you know, finances too. So anyway, just a lot of kind of support for the volunteers, just different things that we kind of hear that might be going on that we try to, to help. Our li uh, library staff also do, they do book recommendations. We get to know everybody so well, not only patrons, but volunteers too, that we can say, hey, by the way, this new book just came in, you know, have you checked it out? It seems like it's something you'd like, you know, things like that. So, oh, also I've given uh, talking points to staff. Um, uh, some of the times, like if we had a new new procedure happening um, and I can't be all the different places, sometimes I just put talking points to staff. And we had one volunteer that was a teen volunteer and he was the fastest shelver and everything else in the West. Um, so I started making lists for staff because they say, wow, we just, you know, get through all of this. And then, you know, you want to be really um, volunteers time is precious. So you want to be careful of that. So I would just put together a list. So anyway. It's kind of fun. <laughs> so with that, um, I love those stories, Carol. So thank you for sharing them. I love the daily joy, especially. Um, we did for our adult literacy volunteers, we did um, a Zoom gathering and had two of them at two different times a day. And um, we had volunteers and staff together shared either um, an odd expertise, so something that you wouldn't think they would know about, um, or show and tell. And so I learned about urban possums, I learned about mushroom hunting, I learned about um, one volunteer shared their screen and it was all photos that they had taken across Oregon. And then we played a guessing game of where that was taken. And so just being able to connect with volunteers as humans was, you know, that's a huge part of just supporting people. Um, 
So we are towards the end. We, um, we do have some suggestions for places that you can learn more. Um, Volunteer Match has free webinars. Um, the Get Involved Clearinghouses from um, the uh, California State Libraries, but they have a ton of just like uh, crowdsourced templates of position descriptions and training plans, and it's all library focused. Um, Volunteer Pro, Energize Inc., um, the Engage Online Journal. Um, I think I put that on there twice because it's so good. Um, <laughs> the um, Association of Leaders in Volunteer Engagement, which is a national organization. Nonprofit Ready has a bunch of online trainings. And then there's also a weekly Zoom for leaders of volunteers in libraries. And that's a national group. And I think I saw Rachel here. Um, Rachel's been in that. And um, it's just great learning about what other library systems across the country are doing right now, um, like where they are in their reopening status or how they handled um, a positive COVID case in their system. And then, of course, how um, how they are bringing volunteers back, things that they're doing with volunteers. So um, there's not like a website for that. It is just kind of a really informal group that came up after the Public Library Association conference last, uh, last February. So if you want in, um, we would be happy to um, just share the link with you. Um, and then we're also going to share this um, these slides with um, Roberta and um, and Rebecca and the rest of the roundtable so that they can share it with you. Um, so that is it. Thank you so, so much for coming and being interested in um, working with volunteers and we would love to hear, we have just a couple minutes. If you have questions, you can unmute. Um, thanks for the claps, Ashley, that's really kind. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out to Carol or myself at any time in the future. I love hearing what other libraries are doing um, and what your struggles are with and all that. So we'll just put it out for questions and um, Thanks everybody for your kind comments. It's just been a, a joy to be here. But please don't hesitate to uh, email us if you have any questions or if anybody wants a sample of a daily joy or a weekly connection, I'm happy to provide that as well. I didn't want to uh, start the question section off with this, but if no one has any other questions, um, could we maybe go back to the concept of like a difficult situation? Um, I haven't had this experience with volunteers at all um, or as a volunteer because I'm both volunteer and paid staff. Uh, but I did have this experience when I worked in another job before where I had been there longer. Someone else came in and they were doing something wrong. And I noticed and I thought to myself, oh, I'll just real quickly correct them. Like, oh, this is how we do this. And then later on, she came to me and kind of got on my case about it. Like, you are not my boss. I don't need to listen to you. Uh, I listen to my boss kind of thing. And like, how, like, is there maybe some advice anybody has for that kind of situation? Because it can happen. You know, just real quickly, I've been doing some FEMA training um, just for emergency things, and they talk about chain of command. Um, and I'm like you, I think people usually are gracious, and they would just accept that and go forward. Um, but the FEMA training with this is chain of command, and it really comes down from the person that is in charge of that uh, person. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel badly because there was some good information that you could have helped that person with, but um, I just, this FEMA training has given me a little bit different perspective on that too. What do you think, Liza? Yeah, I mean, I think in this situation, it sounds like you didn't know the person well enough to know what they would be um, open to accepting. Um, I think- It was a cultural issue. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, I, I tend to be like, you know what, if, if I'm doing something wrong, I want somebody to come directly to me. I don't want them to go to my manager first, you know? So I like to go to the person directly, just like you did, Dory. Um, but I think sometimes when you have that, uh, that type of experience where somebody comes back at you like that, um, that uh, it can definitely sting. I've had that happen for sure. Um, and so in that situation, probably what I would do is, um, you know, uh, probably I would say, oh, I'm, you know, what? I'm so sorry. I didn't know that um, this was going to come across this way. You know, my, my, uh, I was hoping to just help you with this one thing, um, but I can see that it's not coming across well um, as I had hoped. Um, is this, I don't know, like, do, do I want to bring in, should we talk to your supervisor? Because, you know, you go to them. Is that something that you would like to do? You know, I mean, and just, you can just tell them, you know what, I feel, I I feel at the time I was completely blindsided by it. I just apologized profusely as I was only trying to help. I didn't realize, but yeah, yeah, the idea of would you like to go to someone who is in a position above you and talk about this? um, That's, that's good advice. Yeah, I like what um, what Blake is saying in the chat. The volunteers need to be introduced to staff by their supervisor and at that point told that they may expect some feedback from staff other than their boss. Um, you know, set those expectations to avoid surprises and miscommunications. Um, those are all great. That's great advice, Blake. Um, definitely sometimes like half of my job is literally just setting expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so that's excellent, Blake. Eliza, you mentioned something about a volunteer database earlier. Could you go into what that consists of? Oh, yes. That is my like nerdy topic that I love to talk about so much. (laughs) Um, And so we currently use Volgistics, which is a a combination of volunteer logistics. So um, and uh, we are currently looking at something else, a different system, but I don't want to jinx it because it's in the IT process right now. But there are lots of different systems out there that can help you keep track of volunteer data. And that can be really good for um, records retention, um, uh, you know, keeping track of hours so that you can provide annual reports to any management that needs to know that, but also reporting out to the community, like, wow, we have this many volunteers and these are the types of roles that they did. And here's all the things, but also keeping that as a record for the volunteers to come back in, you know, months, years down the line, maybe to say, hey, I'm applying for a job or I'm applying to school. Can you tell me how many hours, um, you know, that I've done? So I'm going to put in the chat. We'll just, oh, Rachel got it. And Ashley, thank you. Um, but there are other other softwares out there too. And so there is usually a cost associated with it. So um, that is definitely something to consider, but it is, um, uh, it's hugely helpful, but you also don't have to have one. Maybe you have a secure spreadsheet where you keep track of things that you can access, you know, years later. Um, there, but there are lots of systems, but um, Bulgistics and other systems can manage um, volunteer signups. Um, so you can have volunteers sign up for their own shifts and things like that. There's another system called, um, there's like Sign Up Genius, which can do that. There's a, another more fully um, inclusive system that you can have like online trainings hosted there too. It's called Better Impact. Um, and let's see other ones volunteer hub is another one so some of them are more um out of the box like here's what you get and you can kind of configure it within that within what they have and then others you can work with them to build from scratch those ones tend to be pricier especially up front than the out of the box ones but um may help you get something more specific if you have um uh, specific needs So I know we are at time. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back to Roberta, but I encourage you all to um, connect with us if you have other questions in the future. 
Um, and just thank you so much for the roundtable for, for having us. Yeah, so on behalf of the staff training roundtable, um, Liza and Carol, thank you so much. That was terrific. You know, for every training topic, if we only had 10 hours, but you did a wonderful job of, of bringing together, you know, so so, much, so many insights and that's such an engaging um, presentation. I actually also wanted to thank everyone for their comments and their questions in the chat. What a really good conversation that we had. So this is being recorded and as soon as it is posted on the OLA uh, staff training round table, um, I will send out the link to everyone who is registered and then thank you to Liza and Carol for making these beautiful slides available as well. So we will include that. So you'll have um, my contact information if you have any questions about the staff training roundtable or if you have suggestions for other topics, uh, feel free to include those as well. Um, on a personal note, you know, I work at a college library and we don't actually have volunteers, but, but you know, maybe we should. So I, I really appreciated everything you said. So thank you again uh, for providing your contact information and I will just wish everyone um, a good morning. Thank you so much.